Okay, good morning. Welcome back to Diverse Ed, the virtual conversation number three. This is our second panel and I'm going to introduce them today. We are talking about a diverse curriculum in this panel. Uh, with us in the studio, we have um, Amjad Ali, who will be talking to us about representation and belonging. He is an assistant head teacher at Senko and he is the co-founder of BAME Ed. After Amjad, we will hear from Jessica Austin Burdett. Um, she'll be talking about creativity, diversity, and social justice, and she's a head of art um, and DT. Following Jess, we have Nick Bentley uh, talking about uh, mental health and LGBT+. He's a lead practitioner and part of the LGBT Ed Steering Group. And following Nick, we have Kate Hollinshead. Welcome, Kate. Um, she'll be talking about uh, LGBT plus equality, uh, how to take a whole school approach. Um, and she's the head of operations at Equality. And then to wrap us up today, we will have our partner speaker, Rahul Karavadra, uh, who is the engagement manager at Lufta, talking about Lufta and, and his experiences there. So I'm going to hand straight over to Amjad to kick us off to talk about representation in belonging. Morning, Amjad. Morning, morning. Thank you. Um, thank you all for all you're doing as well. Welcome to everybody. Um, I'm just going to do like a whistle stop tour on what representation and belonging means to me and what it might mean to others. Um, and cut me off, Benny, okay? If I keep going, just go, Amjad, five minutes, shut up now. Okay, so all of us will have heard of the, the saying, you can't be what you can't see. Marion Wright Ed Edelman talked about this idea of, can, can we really be, is it putting people off the fact that there aren't enough positive role models out there and there isn't enough going on for people to be able to align themselves to, so in terms of representation and belonging. And then we've seen recently many, many things that have come forward that have really inspired engaged people of um, colour, BAME communities. So for example, um, Kamala Harris becoming the first female vice president, black female vice president, and lots and lots of comments were made around that. No one could deny the power of seeing somebody who shares an identity like your gender or your race. And what was fascinating is that um, lots of the conversations around Kamala Harris flowed around this idea of Really, is she the first? Is this really the first? I, I didn't realize. And, and sometimes we don't even quite notice that there isn't been any difference until we see a difference, which is fascinating. And then we think about this and then I think about my own kind of my own heritage, my own roots being a Pakistani Asian male. Uh, Benazir Bhutto was the first female prime minister in a Muslim majority country at the age of 35. And that was a good 20, 25 years ago. Yet it wasn't highlighted as something so groundbreaking at the time. But what we need to think about is what does representation and belonging mean? Because we've always had elements of representation and belonging. Everyone will have heard of Chadwick Boseman and the Black Panther movie in 2016, which was absolutely phenomenal. But Marvel, as a comic book, actually introduced the character in July 1966. And they had a really um, fascinating character name alongside him called Coal Tiger, which lots of people won't have um, heard of or seen of or anything like that. And then people will remember other forms of representation. I don't know if anybody was obsessed with gladiators like I was and you had Rhino and Thunder and Lightning and Black or this and Nightshade and names like that that were representative of us, weren't they? They were, they were representing us, but maybe not in the right kind of format. And then I started to think about those areas and then I thought, okay, black comic superheroes and I don't know if anybody even remembers Blade. Blade was around a long time ago and, um, you know, it's the idea of representation's kind of always been there, but what's it meant and how has it been represented, I think, is the main point that I'm trying to make. And then you've got one of my favourite films ever, Hidden Figures, which highlighted to me, like, totally ignorantly, that these three females that have actually behind the scenes work that did the groundbreaking work. And um, Mary Jackson in the film talks so passionately when she's addressing the judge about wanting to be able to be taught in a um, white only university. And she said, I plan on being an engineer at NASA, but I can't do that without taking them to classes at an all white school. And I can't change the color of my skin, so I have no choice but to be the first, which I can't do without you, sir, your honor. Out of all the cases you've gone here today, which is gonna matter 100 years from now, which is gonna make you the first. So I've always thought about this idea of, okay, if you can't be it, you can't see it. Is that the right angle to look at it? If we can't be it, how can I become it 
to be it for others. And Kamala Harris ended her, her first kind of talk around becoming the first female vice president in saying, I might be the first, but I won't be the last. And now when we think about this in terms of our curriculum, our teaching, lots of schools will say, but we are representative. And then we'll say, but what are you representing and who are you representing? And then we have this whole debate around, but actually this is really important knowledge that we need to get across. And then we need to talk about, actually it's not any more important, it is knowledge. So I'd love for us to think about representation and belonging is important, but what representation and belonging? Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. My wing person has just deleted herself from the app. So in Benny's absence, Jess, I'll welcome you on as our second speaker. Good morning. Thank you. Um, following on very nicely from Anjad, actually. Um, so, I don't know if you can notice, but purple is my favourite colour. And um, it used to be a really labour intensive dye to produce. So, it was only ever used for very expensive fabrics and used to uh, represent as a mark of prestige and aristocracy. Then, in 1856, a very young scientist called William Perkin was trying to synthesise quinine, but instead he synthesised a purple dye and revolutionised the fashion industry. In instead. Um, why am I talking about that? Well, because creativity comes from being able to make connections that other people haven't seen. So one of my um, issues around what we do in schools is how we actually can look at curriculum design to introduce our students to um, issues, events, histories, peoples that can help them to make those creative connections, to open their eyes to wider worlds and wider experiences than their own personal lived experiences, and to um, go beyond what we uh, were talking about just now with Amjad in terms of if we can't see it, we can't be it. Well, I totally and utterly uh, think that's a really, really valuable starting point for my curriculum des design. And for years, I've um, introduced or use my curriculum to introduce students to a range of different artists and experiences to inspire them. But I also think that um, as educators, we need to encourage our learners to look beyond their own lives and the lives of those that they can see around them and to learn about the lives of people that are totally different to them, um, to be introduced to experiences and um, ideas and philosophies that are totally almost alien to them to really open their minds because if we don't do that how do we help them to be able to make those creative connections i was walking home from school the other day with my daughter and she was telling me a story where she basically mashed up um, she's seven by the way she mashed up cinderella with sherlock holmes and created a brand new detective story and she wouldn't have been able to do that if i hadn't read her cinderella and her dad wasn't reading her sherlock holmes at the moment um so over the years this philosophy of um introducing our students to wider experiences underpinned my curriculum design and i think of it as a ripple so um we start off so i'm a secondary school teacher we start off in year seven um encouraging students to explore their sense of self and identity and then we go beyond that and looking at at, um, in the environment, their local environment, but also beyond that, looking at a sense of community. What is community and how it's created? We specifically use architecture actually to explore how architecture can create um, and build community. But then we also look at the environment and climate change, which then leads us to look at global issues in year nine. And then they get to uh, make choices about which issues they want to explore. And through that, we look at a series of different artists and designers and makers who um, have explored topics and come at problem solving from very different angles to those that our students may be used to seeing um, around them um, in the news and in their local area. I teach in a school in London. And we have a lot of um, examples of interesting things in London and places and stuff like that but our students don't often access um, that information so by opening those doors we're giving them those opportunities to start to begin to engage with those with that information and begin to uh, process that information and by processing it they're then allowing that we're allowing them to make those connections and develop that thinking so that suddenly those spark moments occur I can't always be there when those things happen because it can happen at home and all, in all sorts of spaces on the bus wherever but those ping moments where, where, where all any of us can make connections can't happen if we've never introduced our students to that information in the first place. Um, and one of the uh, big things I love about 
teaching art and DT is that we can introduce our students to topics and issues and conversations and questions, huge, big things, big problems, um, and have conversations around them. We don't necessarily always find the answers, but at least we allow our students to begin those conversations and engage in those conversations. But one thing I would say is that you do need to think quite carefully about how you introduce those conversations and what your um, what your boundaries are, what the rules are around how you discuss those things. Social justice conversations about fairness and, and the world inequality and the kind of lives that people have lived can be very sensitive topics. Um, we need to encourage our students to be very sensitive, open and curious about these things um, and we need to nurture them and basically my whole thing is about encouraging our students to develop a desire for curiosity and improving their own lives and the lives of others and developing a sense of responsibility and understanding um, their own power and engaging them in that sense of acquiring that power and empowering them through um, understanding how other people have gone into the world and engaged with the world and um, been empowered by that process and if we can look at how we can introduce at least just one person is there one person or one question or one issue that you that is relevant to the topics you're teaching that you could introduce your students to that would help them engage with the whole process of um, where we are in the world who we are in the world and what we can do to better our world Thank you, Jess. That was really, really interesting. We've had some great comments about, imagine if we'd all been in, taught art this way, if we'd all studied art this way. And I think that's a testament to the work that you're doing. Thank you so much for sharing that. I'm going to move on to Nick to share his thoughts. Nick, are you ready to share with us? I certainly am. Thank you, Benny. Uh, morning and morning, everyone. It's um, great to have these conversations, isn't it? I think it's incredibly important. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, mental health and LGBTQ plus people because I think it's incredibly important. Um, and I think I wanted to talk about mental health because I think there are more and more conversations happening about mental health at the moment, actually. There's a lot going on um, and it's important that we're starting to have some of those conversations. But I think that it's still an area that we need to think about really carefully and really meaningfully. You know, one in four people report uh, having a mental health problem and um, that, that's every year and one in six people every week as well. And I think that are quite, you know, quite sobering statistics and important that we reflect on that and think about it. But actually, if you think about the LGBTQ plus community specifically and our community's experiences of some of these issues, actually, we are more likely, sadly, to experience some of these things we're more likely to experience depression we're more likely to experience anxiety we're more likely to experience low self-esteem too and i don't think there's any good reason why people who are lgbtq plus should have any of these um, outcomes so it's incredibly important that we think about maybe why is this happening and then what can we do as educators too to think about it and you know hate crime statistics sadly are increasing they are on the up at the moment um, in many different contexts and many different areas and this includes our community and I think it's incredibly important that we ourselves also think about well what can we do to help with that and this of course gets even worse if you think about the fact that many people have intersecting identities and there can be different experiences of discrimination as well it's really important that we think about what that means as well um, and for LGBTQ plus people of colour and trans people in particular there are real issues and real problems so we need to think I think really carefully what can we do to support with this because it has been been shown and the Mind UK uh, research into this shows that discrimination has an impact on people's mental health. Thinking then specifically as educators, what is the role that we have in this? Um, because sadly in schools as well there are real issues that have um, come up as a result of this because you will see that a lot of young people experience mental health conditions um, and LGBTQ plus young people have this as well but often it is um, worse for them and um, trans young people as well um, in particular report real issues with this so I think it's incredibly important then we think about for us as educators what are the lessons that we can take from this and what can we do because um, the research also shows because I don't want to be a, a gloom you know monger here or the harbinger of you know gloom and doom really but there are things that we can do to make it better um, and where LGBTQ plus people have the opportunities to really be authentic about themselves, to experience their lived identities and to make connections with other people who are LGBTQ+. That is something that can be fixed and that is something that we can make positive as well. So what I'm going to suggest is a few 
ideas and thoughts about ways that we could do things that are going to improve this. Um, I think when we're thinking about students, when we're thinking about students as well, um, the curriculum is an incredibly important issue and we need to make sure that we're thinking about what that looks like. There's been some really good work done, I think in particular recently, um, by Stonewall, Schools Out, LGBT History Month, getting the message out, getting resources out, getting materials out that are really helpful and important for people. So I think that's the, the first thing to do. You know, um, both um, people who have spoken so far have, have said really important comments, I think, around you need to be able to see yourself and you need to be able to see yourself being re represented. So that's the first thing that I would say. Um, as well as that, of course, though, what else is the school doing? We need to have proper mental health policies in school and all young people need to have access to that support, as frankly, I think, do staff. Um, and it's important that those things are enacted and are in place as well. We need to think about the policies that we have, the anti-bullying policies that we use and um, the equality policies that we have as well. But I think I was speaking a little bit before about this idea of feeling connected as well and having groups. So that's something else that I would think about. And you can have diversity, equality groups within in schools and I think that's something that I would really advocate and encourage people to do but then for staff too is there a mental health support opportunities available for them and are staff really encouraged to feel authentic within their own lived identities because what I would say absolutely I agree that it's incredibly important that everyone has the opportunity to see themselves and to be reflected within their communities and within the curriculum that they study but as well as the opportunity to see themselves, you also need to have that opportunity to be yourself as well. And I think actually that, that's what everyone really needs here. And um, I can see that unfortunately, I think um, my uh, connectivity issues have struck again. So I'm really sorry if you haven't heard all of that, but um, I hope you got some of my points and um, thank you. Thank you, Nick. It was a little bit crackly, but we actually got every, uh, most of us got every word. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Um, and there's lots of connections coming out now uh, between the idea of kind of mental health and that positive representation you know, that Amjad was talking about at the start um, and the need to feel connected. And, and, and that's that's coming through really strongly. Thank you, Nick. Can we move on to Kate? Uh, following on from Nick's thoughts about LGBT. Kate, over to you. Thank you very much. And it does follow on very nicely. It's almost like we planned it actually with your mention of diversity working groups and policies and procedures, because that's one of my starting points. Uh, thank you. It's nice to, to be here. So I'm here from Equality, which is a, a not for profit equality and diversity training and consultancy organisation working with schools and um, uh, other education settings and organisations. Um, so we carried out um, a programme of work with 30 primary schools in Greater London between 2019 and 2020 on how to um, embed LGBT plus equality. And those schools were chosen as schools that would, had found this area of quality quite tricky to navigate previously and were very much at the very beginning of their journey in, in embedding LGBT plus equality. And so the programme really looked at putting those diversity working groups in place, making sure that governors and SLT were part of that, um, overhauling policies and procedures. We delivered whole staff training um, and really led, we were led by what the schools wanted to do as much that, as, as they wanted to do to kind of develop and create LGBT plus inclusive curriculums and environments. And we have developed a good practice guide, which is free of charge on our website as well. So do have a little look at that. That's got kind of a lot more information about how to do this work. Um, so. I wanted to just spend a bit of time thinking about some of the barriers that some of those schools um, had found themselves up against, I suppose, in carrying out this work and then what worked well in the programme, some sort of hints and tips, I suppose, for people to take away. So first of all, there was a real fear of adverse reactions um, and some schools wanted to go ahead with this work without telling parents or carers, sort of get it, fly it under the radar a little. Um, best intentions there, I'm sure, but, but of course it's so important that parents parents and carers buy into this work and have any kind of myths or uh, misunderstandings um, sort of out there at the front and, and dealt with. And there were some of those definitely that kind of flew around in mum's WhatsApp groups or on mum's net. And um, there were lots of kind of those those usual myths of if we talk about LGBT plus equality, will it make people gay or transgender? Or is this going to be age inappropriate? Are we going to be teached about sex? All of those things came out and then we could just have a conversation about what it absolutely isn't and what it is. 
Um, some schools also surveyed pupils and explain, asked, asked pupils what they thought about this area of equality, which is fantastic, but did so without informing parents and carers. Then, of course, parents and carers felt on a back foot and a bit concerned and didn't have any of those answers to the questions that pupils went home with inevitably. And then we had a couple of church schools as well that had pushback from, from some governors uh, and some concerns. So we found what went well was, of course, informing parents and carers about the work at, uh, at the very top of the programme and getting those concerns out. Clear messaging about the school's approach and what it does and doesn't entail. So really, once it was drilled down to these are the key messages that LGBT plus people exist. Um, there are rights and protections and laws in place to protect trans people um, and, and LGB people in um, society and that, you know, bullying is not acceptable and, you know, we, we, it's important to accept anyone regardless of any protected characteristic. And when it was kind of drilled down to those key messages, people were like, oh, right, well, if that's all you're teaching children, then then that's fine, that's okay. Um, so having having those conversations, we produced some uh, a pamphlet for parents and carers as well to how to answer those tricky questions, just in case any came home, they felt armed and ready to, to answer those. Um, so, so this was kind of our uh, approach. It was all really about trying to get as much buy-in as possible. There were so many myths around, there had, this was on the back of the, um, the protests outside lots of schools in Birmingham as well about the No Outsiders work that was happening in Birmingham schools so it was a it was an interesting kind of time to, to carry out this work but so so needed as a, as Nick and some of the statistics that you mentioned uh, alludes to so some of the things that schools put in place um so just a few a few kind of little things that they 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 did to sort of really improve their school um First of all, lots of schools decided to put sort of scripts on the back of their lanyards, their, their lanyards that says what their name is, scripts for dealing with things like that's so gay or you're so gay that can be a bit of an epidemic in schools. Um, and so that there was a con clear, consistent message. Lunchtime supervisors had it all staff. It was challenged constantly. And every staff member knew that they had the backing of SLT as well in what they were saying. Again, we had those um, uh, SLT alongside Equality Each drafted how to answer questions from pupils about LGBT plus um, equality and again that had buy-in um, teachers could feel really confident in the classroom I'm saying this and I know that, that, that this is uh, acceptable and then lots of other things about inclusive language and how to embed and deliver specific work about LGBT plus and I think that is my time to to wrap up. <laughs> It is, Kate, but we will have some opportunities to talk to you when we have a question. So if you've missed anything, there will be chances. Um, I'm going to go over to Rahul now from Lifter, who is one of our partner organisations. Rahul, can you follow that for me, please? Yeah. Hi, Benny. Thank you uh, for introducing me. Uh, hi, everyone. Hope you're all well. I'm going to be talking about bringing the curriculum to life through uh, human stories. So growing up, I was always on the edge of my seat when family members told me their stories of lives in Uganda and Kenya and what it was like growing up in the 70s and 80s as first generation migrants. Uh, hearing their stories allowed me to see them as multifaceted individuals with passions and interests that I was previously unaware of. And growing up, this inquisitiveness developed into an urge to find out more about people from other communities and cultures. This eventually led me to doing a master's in global citizenship, identities and human rights, specializing in diaspora identity construction in relation to host nation experiences and long distance nationalism. Poor, all right, my dad still doesn't understand it to this day, but in essence, what, I, uh, what it was, was I'm still trying to understand how my human story is shaped, influenced, and connected to the story of others. And as a species, we've always been drawn to stories, from paintings on cave walls to the blockbusters we see on our screens. If we look at Western Africa, we can see how important human stories were to society through the griot. Griots are the repositories of all histories and traditions. People would tell their stories to griots and it was their responsibility to remember them and retell them to others, passing down lessons that could be retold and learned from. It was said that when a griot passed away, it was like a library had been burnt down. That's how important they were. And at their essence, one could say that a griot is a teacher, just without the planning, the marking, the lesson observations. In this age of postmodern globalism, where identities are negotiated and stretched across permeable borders and interconnected histories, it's important that a diverse range of stories are told. And it's through the acquiring and exchange of cultural capital 
that the division between self and the other can be dissolved. When we're able to build bridges and lay the foundations of understanding and empathy, as well as the uh, awareness of connectivity, both on a micro and macro level, we are each other's environment. And as educators, we find ourselves in a similar role to that of the griot, with even more importance. We are responsible for sharing the human stories from all across the world. And these stories have become more important than ever. In the past few years alone, we've seen a rise in neo-nationalism, xenophobia and global temperatures, not to mention the physical and mental scarring of Brexit and the death of George Floyd, and more recently, the storming of the Capitol in the USA. We must remember to harness the power of humanity for the common good, and human stories allow us to do just this. At Lifter, we capture human stories in the form of short documentaries. These are turned into 360 immersive and interactive spaces where teachers and students can learn about people, places, skills and values. At a time when school trips are on pause and the ability to travel and have close human interactions are restricted, Lifter allows pupils to meet the likes of Quensley in the Caribbean, Kyutin in Hong Kong, or in Anna in Ethiopia. Teaching and learning through human stories can be a useful and powerful way to ensure that students have experiences of the world as part of their entitlement to cultural capital. Lifter can be used as a tool to teach an understanding of protected characteristics and show how equality and diversity are promoted and reflected within our schools. We've seen that teaching through immersive human stories can bring a depth, breadth and meaning to concepts for children, moving learning from information to knowledge. Pupil allow, uh, Lifter allows pupils to explore complex concepts, enabling teachers to unlock their critical thinking skills, but also develop their vocabulary and oracy skills too. Our vision at Lifter is that by the time the child, a child completes their education, they will have visited every country in the world and met at least one person from every place they go. If you'd like to find out more and get one term's free access to Lifter, please go to lifter.com or follow the link in the chat. Our fully funded and level two certified Connecting Classrooms through Global Learning program empowers teachers to weave global human stories into their curriculum and guides teachers through the Lifter platform so that they can use it for both in-class and remote learning. So all I've got left to say is, where will you travel to first? Thank you. Thank you for that, Rahul. Honestly, um, first of all, uh, as a fellow East African Asian, hello, there's a whole community of us out, out there. There's been some comments about it. There's, there's, there's a few of us floating around. So high five. Um, thank you to all of our panelists for sharing their thoughts on curriculum and representation and, and finding those models uh, so that other teachers can start to, to build schools that have these diverse communities represented. I'm gonna hand back over to Hannah now to go over the comments in the chat. I think there's a stunned silence. There's lots of positive comments. There's hardly any questions. So I have some of my own questions. Please put those questions onto the thread, guys. Um, the first couple of questions that came through. So I'm going to ask this one to Jess and then follow up with Amjad. There was a question around, like, how do we create the conditions for these respectful conversations to approach diversity, equity, inclusion with curiosity, but but and, and in a non-confrontational way? So Jess, if I can ask you about in your classroom environment, and then Amjad, perhaps thinking about corridors and corridors and playgrounds. So Jess, you first, please. Um, it's about having a conversation about rules and responsibilities, rights and responsibilities and respect and what we should say and what we shouldn't say. So I have a really basic rule. If you wouldn't want your mum to hear you say that to somebody, keep it in your head. Um, and so little rules like that. But what I do is introduce people and ways of thinking through the topic. So we talk about why this topic is important to the class and to the world and um, you know all the other issues in between and then um, talk about rules and responsibilities and rights and respect and it all basically my basic rule in every classroom I've ever taught in for years now is one rule respect that's it basic for everything and everyone. Thank you Jess in a class we've got a bit more control haven't we over our culture yes. and how about corridors and playgrounds how do you navigate it in those spaces? It's just a f effective um, rules and stipulations, isn't it? It's just about being a human in terms of corridors and uh, 
out of class environments. The law, incidentally, is very unknown to lots of young people in terms of what we can do and what we can't do. And being a citizenship teacher, actually explaining that that's actually not acceptable, that would actually be against the law and just breaking those barriers down into this misconstrued idea of its freedom of speech. There's no freedom of hate. There's no freedom of violence. There's no freedom of inciting. So it's thinking about how we can firstly make ourselves aware of what is and what isn't okay, but also as a human to human connection, that's, that's, that's not cool. That's not all right. Um, and lots of people kind of remove our veneer from who we are in our classroom and I always say be you and you have to represent yourself otherwise they'll say but I'm not saying it to you sir I'm cool with you sir and I'm like that is who I am so you are saying it to me and that sometimes comes as a shock but no no but I'm not saying it to you and so it's having those uncomfortable comfortable conversations Thank you, Amjad. Um, I'm going to come to you next, Rahul. Um, a question here about how do we get teachers to feel confident in sharing these stories and feeling like they have the tools to answer students' questions if it's not a story from their own lived experience? That's a really interesting question. I think teachers also have to be comfortable in understanding where their knowledge ends and being really clear about that. But um, the training we provide, we want to guide teachers to feel more confident in having these discussions. So the Connecting Classrooms through, uh, through Global Learning Programme would be a great, I'm plugging again here, but it'd be a great um, way to kind of introduce them to the concept of sharing stories, understanding how they need to evaluate stories, understand the framework in which they fall within, um, and the narratives that run through that, because they need to feel confident in being able to share that. Thank you, Rahul. And moving to the other stakeholder group of parents, Kate, um, there's some just some curiosity about like what were the biggest pushbacks from the parents and carers community in, in that piece of work you did in those South London primary schools? Thank you. Um, so I think it was really those those myths that just there was so much misinformation about what this this work actually entails and so much concern that it was about promoting one protected characteristic at the detriment of all the others and so there were parents there going okay you're doing work on LGBT plus equality but what about Islamophobia what about anti-semitism what about disability discrimination and so making sure that within the school there is a there is a platform for every area of equality and that there's work being done on every area of equality so there was that kind of concern um, but those kind of myths about um, it would be showing children inappropriate images, talking to them about inappropriate things, and just making sure that par parents had that confidence in us as an external organisation and in their school leaders that, of course, everything will be appropriate to an age group. And it's talking about different families and love and identity and relationships and um, different different facets of different identities. And it's, it's not talking about any of those things that sometimes the media would um, would have you, or social media indeed, would have you believe. So I think those are some of the things. If I can go back to the first question, actually, because we have found that, um, sorry, that first question that, um, that you um, posed to Jess and Amjad, because um, we have found that anonymous questioning can be quite helpful as well to allow really nervous young people that are desperate to answer a question but really scared of offending anyone or getting it wrong. So things like you could just do a survey monkey questionnaire or an ask it basket. Now, I can't take credit for the name, as excellent as it is, but just having that in a classroom or in a corridor that it can anonymously throw a question in and then teachers have got some time to read it, digest, and actually plan how to answer that kind of question or a similar kind of thing a wonder wall get a sharpie and, and write it on a on a wall that has been designated for that purpose must, must stress that love it kate thank you i think every school listening is going to get an ask it basket now so that's a fab that's a fab little catchphrase thank you um nick coming to you about um safe spaces um just a question from one of the listeners about like how important or how do we go about creating those lgbt clubs in a secondary school the question is about and who should run those those clubs create those spaces great questions um i would say firstly that there are um some amazing um charities out there that have loads of support Support on this. So, for example, just like us is a charity which does great work in schools. It's the LGBT plus young people's charity, and I've worked with um, them before, and they've provided incredible resources and valuable help that has also been useful at the moment with the move to online learning. 
happening as well, because obviously that's a problem right now. Now that um, a lot of face to face interactions that we would normally have in safe spaces has become a lot more challenging. Um, so I would say, firstly, look, look at the um, you know the information that's already out there and the resources that are out there. And I am going to post them later. I'm going to sign post them to people on Twitter if you're interested in them. But what I would also say is, from my own experience, I think that they are incredibly important. In terms of who runs them, people, staff, you know, get people at your school to do it, but um, don't take it all on yourself. I think if you're sitting here and thinking, well, I'd like to do that, it's a lot of work. You know, everyone, I know everyone who works in schools and colleges are incredibly busy. And I think actually a lot of this work is more powerful when it's done in cooperation with different groups of people. So get your friends in there, get different staff in there, get allies, people who are supportive, people you want to work with, because it's so powerful for young people to have those um, advocates, um, you know, members of staff there supporting them and speaking to them. I think it's incredibly important that you do that. Um, and then I think in terms of the space, you know, just signpost it, make it very, very clear if you're able to get a, um, like a, a notice board or something to let people know where those meetings are going to be and where the discussions are going to happen. Very, very clear, like um, people were saying earlier, rules and regulations, etc. at the start. Hello. Um, um, really, yeah, those kind of things are the things that I would suggest. I've been upstage. <laughs> right. Thank you, Nick. Hi, hi Zaki. Let me just see you here. Um, the next question is for you, Amjad. Um, what's the starting point um, when we begin to look at the curriculum and representation in the curriculum? Where, where do you start, Amjad? Um, the thing is, the, good, the great thing about it is you can start pretty much anywhere you like. Um, I mean, I'm not saying this because Benny's here. Maybe read her book to start with as well. Um, that, that might help. Um, but in terms of the starting points around curriculum and curriculum development, I think it's a mindset first. Firstly, accept that sharing wider knowledge and sharing knowledge that isn't just um, difficulties and all of those things isn't necessarily going to dumb down your curriculum. And also accept that you have gaps in your knowledge and you have gaps in what you need to do and you need to upskill yourself. And I, I, I would say that lots of our resistance towards making changes isn't because we want don't want to make changes. It's just because we haven't got the time to make more or make different. And, and that's not to say that we shouldn't do it, but we've got to start being smarter about it. We share so much in terms of different subjects and different areas. We now need to share more about diversity and more about inclusivity within the systems as well. So I would say there's no direct starting point other than educating yourself and then thinking about what you're going to do as a result of that. Thank you, Amjad. Um, back to you, Kate. Um, Ask It Basket's gone down well, but what other strategies are there to support pupils feeling that they are heard? How do we capture that, that child-student voice in our schools? Um, so in, in our programme of work, we asked, uh, it was in primary school, so sort of key stage two, we carried out questionnaires with them. Um, and that was questionnaires on all areas of the quality as well, just as a you know, why, why not? Why don't we have a look at what's going on um, in, in all areas as well as LGBT plus equality while we're doing that questionnaire? Um, and for younger pupils, so we um, provided teachers with resources to carry out circle time activities just to gather their understanding and thoughts. So, um, and then those were sort of uh, written up and we could sort of assess where younger pupils were as well. So it's just about sort of tailoring it. Um, anything that's excuse me, anything like, um, you know, uh, when we deliver workshops, we go in and um, ask pupils to write down a sort of a burning question, I suppose, on a post note anonymously, one question that they would like answered during that session. Um, and then hopefully those are those are woven through throughout the session or answered at the end. Um, but really producing activities and resources that just get to the heart of what they're thinking. That will increase their engagement. So again, we do one word activities, write a description of a person on a post-it note and ask them to write down um, what they associate with or what they've heard associated with that person. Then we can start unpicking the myths um, and the misconceptions. Those kind of activities, all of this should be done within a safe space. And I know that Jess alluded to that a little bit earlier. So making sure that there's some ground rules in place and that there's a framework for disagreeing 
agreeing with people respectfully. So we use conversation starters, which are, um, you know, just nice sentence starters, which help frame that that conversation um, in, a, in a friendly way, directing challenges towards the front of the room as well, rather than at each other. So people don't feel personally attacked, you know, and they feel that they're still able to ask questions. Um, and so you don't want anyone to be feel, sort of feeling shut down because someone's kind of been confrontational. So just making sure that um, people, feel, people feel safe in the classroom. And then those other kind of anonymous asking uh, questions. Uh, ways of asking questions outside the classroom as well. Thank you. We've got a couple more quick, quick questions before I hand back to Benny. So, Andrea, back to you with your Senko hat on. There's a question about how you navigate these conversations in a SEND space, perhaps a special school where the children's processing is different. Any thoughts on that? I mean, those educators will have various tools um, depending on the specific needs. Uh, for example, social stories, comic book conversations, um, looking around, breaking those things down in more accessible manners. So, for example, there's lots of um, accessibility via YouTube kids video clips. Um, there's lots of accessibility via um, subject association websites. So, for example, National Autistic Society, British Dyslexia Association. So tapping into the resources that are out there. Lots of people like, you know, would say all these organizations have become woke and all of this kind of nonsense. But it's that idea of actually people are realizing that this is needed. And even the fact that that kind of, I've never ever heard that question ever asked before. So the fact that somebody's even thinking, how do we address this for stu students that have a different processing ability is absolutely brilliant to hear. So there's tapping into those areas and tapping into what it is, but I guess, Special school teachers will just be listening to me going, don't worry, we got this in terms of um, how to make that accessible for them. Thank you, Amjad. And back to you, Nick, a question about how do you support an adult, a staff member with their mental health and well-being if they can't see it themselves? That's quite that's quite a difficult question. But any, any thoughts on that, Nick? It's a difficult question, but it's a good question and an important question, I think. I actually think I did want to talk about mental health specifically, and I, I wanted to get in there in my section when I spoke about everything is important all of these conversations are important but for mental health specifically you do need to have mental mental health support in the school um I'm very lucky in my school I know that there there are opportunities for staff to speak to um counsellors and for individual questions around mental health support so that's incredibly important so there does need to be something that's specifically for mental health support and what I would say is if you're struggling to find within your own immediate um, context that you're working Working within um, that kind of um, opportunities for visibility, try to find outside of the institution that you're working in. So, you know, Twitter is an incredible tool. I'm sure a lot of people will be accessing this via Twitter today. We've got the LGBT ed network that I'm um, on the steering group for that I'm talking about this morning that um, I think has got a lot of ways of connecting individuals. Um, I do Twitter chats on Thursday evenings that I really encourage people to do. There's a book coming out for LGBT ed, um, which I would have to encourage people to read because I think actually being able to see yourself and um, if you, it's not within the immediate context that you've got there are more opportunities to do that and I think it's incredibly powerful but yeah what I would say around mental health is you do need to have bespoke mental health support and that's incredibly important too. Thank you the final question I'm going to leave with you all to then share your thoughts on social media there was a question about like what sh what aspects of DEI should be included um, at a university higher education um, PDCE kind of level. So perhaps you can all have a think about that and share that in your various social media. And I know that Lyft has got some, some contributions they do to PGCs as well. Back to you, Benny. Okay, so we've got about three minutes left and I'm going to pose the challenge uh, in those three minutes that each of our speakers is going to give us uh, one top takeaway about diversity in the curriculum. And by curriculum, I mean, you know, not just the academic curriculum, the wider curriculum and the inner curriculum. So I'm going to start with you, Jess. Okay, can you give us 30 seconds on what your top takeaway is? Um, so my top takeaway is look at one particular aspect of your curriculum that you feel could really benefit from being uh, used to introduce more diverse topics or ways of thinking and then read as much as you can find out as much as you can about that topic so that you feel super confident when you're going into the classroom to have those conversations and by doing that reading you'll find your own connections that you may be able to then introduce as questions to students to start their own thinking process 
processes too. But read up, feel confident, and really sort of think about how you structure and introduce that topic and relate it to the current topic they're studying. So it's not just blown at them, um, that it's introduced slowly and that you think really carefully about the type of questions that you ask and the ways that you um, uh, encourage students to answer those questions. Fab, thank you so much. I'm going to go over to you, Rahul. What do you use? Oh, I just lost you there, Benny. Just your top takeaways. Uh, just to say to schools, if you are looking to introduce a global perspective to your curriculum and bring in the voices of others into the classroom and to teleport children to other parts of the world, um, please do come and join us at, at Lifter on our on our um, webinars. They're all throughout January and February. They're all fully funded. I mean, some of the stories I've seen have actually left lumps in my throat. Like it's so moving. Um, and like this, the scenes that you can explore going to the Caribbean, even if you're a teacher and you just want to get away and relax from your class and just see the waves and, and chill in some sunshine, come, come and see us. Thanks. Thank you, Rahul. That was really useful. Amjad, over to you. Your top takeaway, please. So um, obviously being Asian, you can't just give things or can't just receive things without giving back. So um, if you come to my mum's house with food, you leave with food as well. So um, I want to share with you our website, um, baymednetwork.com, in which we've got a resources section. And in the resources section, if people say to us, well, we don't know any diverse books, have a look. We don't know any diverse speakers, have a look. We don't know where to get stats and research from, have a look. So like Jess said, pick an area and then focus in on that area. But also you know, don't just rely on that neighbor next to you that you think, oh, I could just ask that person all the questions because some of us are a bit tired answering all the questions all the time. So it might just be, I thought of this little check-in, little thinking point, but also empower yourself. Thank you, Amjad. Okay, last 30 seconds. We're going to go to Nick. Take away, please. Thank you. Two things, and two takeaways. I hope that's not, that's all right. First Takeaway is it isn't a quick thing. There is no quick. There are no quick fixes to this, and you do need to work on reviewing the curriculum and um, doing the hard work that is important there. However, um, that's not an excuse to not do the work in the short term. And what I would say is, if you are struggling for time on getting resources together, make use of the incredible resources that are already out there. And um, I promise I will tweet. And finally, Kate, your top takeaway, please. Okay, I think um, my top take takeaway would be um, undertake what we call a diversity walk in, in your school, in your setting, or ask pupils to do so as well. So take a camera, take a notepad, walk around the, the school and see what it says to you. Um, that can be really eye-opening, particularly if pupils do it, because you can see the areas where are, there are really safe areas and there's lots of representation and perhaps areas where there are sort of in the physical environment unsafe and you can do things about it. So undertaking that diversity walk. Thank you so much, Kate, and thank you to all of our speakers uh, for this panel. It's been really, really engaging and there's been lots of positive comments. So please do look on Twitter because people are talking. Hannah, final words? I'm desperate for a coffee, so we'll see you all in 13 minutes time at 11 o'clock.